So before I start, I for sure also would like to thank for the invitation and the possibility to speak here about a topic which in architectural history normally is not so often referred to about bridges. Um, buildings often carry symbolic messages. Probably the most obvious one is transported by bridges, transforming landscapes, countries or people which had been separated before into neighbors. But in contradiction to this constitutional idea of peace, bridges can also develop into symbols of a dangerous threat or domination. This is what happens especially in war times. Particularly due to the construction of a vast motorway system, the Autobahn, Germany developed during the reign of the National Socialists into a, quote, land of bridge building, end quote. When the Second World War broke out, the skills acquired through the previous erection of more than 5,000 motorway bridges turned out to be also useful for war. My lecture will discuss the involvement of German bridge builders in the war process by focusing on some of their key figures. The construction of the Autobahn was ordered by Adolf Hitler as early as summer 1933, and work on one of the most extensive infrastructure endeavors of its times was started the same year under supervision of the Inspector General for German Roads, Fritz Todt. Due to its combination of economy stimulation, application of the latest technology and cultural aspects, the Autobahn developed into the ideal screen of projection for the National Socialists' announcement of the onset of a new era. Owing to the concept of a street network avoiding intersections at the same level, bridges became a central constituent of the motorway. But Todd soon had to fear that the anticipated propagandistic effect of the Autobahn would lose much of its glance due to the lack of a proper design quality of the first overpasses, which had been planned in a hustle by engineers originating from the railway authorities. Therefore, he engaged in 1934 the well-known architect Paul Bonatz as an artistic advisor who soon became known as Pontifex Maximus of the Autobahn. <laughs> In the following years, Bonatz developed into the key figure for the design of the bridges on the so-called Roads of the Führer. Backed by the two leading bridge engineers of the motorways, Gottwald Schaper and Karl Schechtele, as well as the latter's young assistant Fritz Leonhardt and the architect Friedrich Tams, um, he soon, Bonatz soon implemented a corporate design philosophy for the bridges of this vast project. Even if most of the autobahn bridges cannot be valued as outstanding constructions, the refined engineering aesthetic of nearly all the structures, reaching from small culverts to gigantic viaducts, played a key role for the international enthusiasm towards the German motorways. But while myriads of international bridge engineers started to peregrinate to the new wonder roads, the original modernist concept of the bridges increasingly was supplemented by regional references and a representative monumentality. This tendency was even intensified when the Autobahn was affected for the first time by Hitler's war preparations in 1936. Directly after Hitler's announcement of the introduction of a four-year plan with an official goal of preparing the country for war, Todd was forced to commit all employees of the motorways to massive reductions in the use of steel, something that we have just heard also in the lecture before. Um, as the necessity, necessity of avoiding steel usage met with a growing tendency beyond the architects of the Autobahn uh, to apply stone and bridge construction, a growing number of bridges did not show the light-weighted modernity of a progressive infrastructure project anymore but became a sort of anachronistic monument in stone, showing a severe, man, one might say, um, imperial attitude. While the stone bridges of the motorway only were a sort of byproduct of the rearmament politics, from 1938 uh, on, the Autobahn staff also got directly involved in the war preparation machinery. When Todd was commissioned, with the er erection of a 400 mile long line of defensive forts and tank traps, the so-called Westwall. Effectively employing the engineering skills and experiences in handling large-scale projects from the Autobahn, 
a branch office of Todd's General Inspectorate, already in September 1938, provided work for some 240,000 men in the new organization, which soon was called unofficially Organisation Todd, or short OT. A good year later, the erection of the Westwall bound 500,000 workers and exhausted half of Germany's cement production. Consequently, the construction of this defensive line not only caused another shortage of building materials for the Autobahn, but also resulted in a growing lack of workforce. Nevertheless, in 1938, still more than 1,000 bridges were finished on the motorways, and none of the 3,000 workers assembled on the occasion of celebrating the inauguration of the 3,000th kilometer in December 1938 would have thought that this could have been the last glamorous event for the Autobahn. But as early as spring 1939, the increasing occupation of Autobahn engineers with the construction of the Westwall uh, resulted in a distinct deceleration of the work speed at the motorways. Following the invasion of Poland on 1st September 1939, the situation for the Autobahn changed even more. As the combat engineers of the army only were able to provide very provisional solutions, Todd was asked by the supreme commander of the army to repair the devastated traffic infrastructure in the occupied territories. Following on the heels of the forward-moving Wehrmacht, also many of the motorways bridge engineers had to take over now a growing number of tasks outside of Germany's borders. Gottwald Schaper, for instance, organized the reconstruction of railway bridges behind the front. For this, he established a system of special railway bridge departments, which alone in the course of the Russian campaign directed 30 steel construction platoons operating independently behind the front. As it soon became obvious that the number of portable component bridges provided by the army was by far not sufficient, Sharpa also initiated the development of a new makeshift bridge system, the Sharper Krupp Reichsbahn Brückengerät, SKR. Around 100,000 tons of such SKR bridges with a maximum span of 120 meter were installed in the course of the war. Furthermore, Sharpa developed a bracing formed of wood, angle irons and threaded rods, the so-called Sharpa Verband, to provide stability to constructions which had to be assembled with any usable steel girders available on site. We can see this. The other leading motorway bridge engineer, Karl Schechtele, took over the responsibility for the reconstruction of all destroyed road bridges. Under his superintendence, many of the Autobahn's most capable bridge engineers provisionally repaired bridges behind the front. Furthermore, Schechtele's tasks soon went far beyond the sole organization of provisional bridge repairs. While the Polish campaign was still in action, his bridge building units also simultaneously started to plan new bridges, quote, in the style of the motorways, quote, end, to underline the German character, especially of Poland's most important river, the Vistula. While, for example, the Brückenamt Torn planned a monumental stone bridge for the city of Torun, Schechtele himself developed downstream a new crossing close to the city of Dirschau or Czech in Polish. Situated directly on the border between Poland and the German exclave of Eastern Prussia, the two bridges of Dirschau had been the first edifices to be destroyed in the Second World War due to a failed German surprise attack in the early hours of the 1st September 1939. Especially the older bridge from the 1850s, which we see here on the right side, the first long-span railway bridge on the continent, had not only been famous as an engineering undertaking, but also because the cooperating architect Friedrich Stühler had integrated the demanded defense structures into a highly representational bridge architecture. As the new bridge was planned close to this hallmark of German engineering, Schechtele cooperated from the beginning with the architect Friedrich Tams, whose proposal for the Rhine Bridge at Frankenthal already had initiated a fundamental shift in the design culture for motorway bridges. While even the monumental stone viaducts had been bound to the modernist idea of developing the expression of a bridge only out of its constructive premises. Tams Frankenthal Bridge had drawn back on the 19th century concept of autonomous architectural treatments 
by presenting fortress-like towers that were apparently inspired by the early Prussian railway bridges over the Rhine and the Vistula, as we can see when we compare these two examples. Tam's first proposal for the new Vistula bridge developed this approach even further. Rising higher over the roadway than in Frankenthal, the two towers not only directly revealed their military task, but also occupied the former Polish river bank in a grand symbolic gesture. In a second version, Tams dramatized this aspect even more, proposing now two 80 meter high towers framed by a large service area to allow the future travelers to contemplate over the strength of the Third Reich during a coffee break. Even though the dimensions of Tams' proposal may have been caused to a certain extent by specific requirements in this place of the army, the Vistula Bridge strongly influenced the further design of Autobahn bridges. Without a doubt, it sounds somewhat strange to talk of an influence on Autobahn bridges after the outbreak of the war. But besides the intense employment of motorway engineers behind the front, works on the motorways also continued. Certainly, the loss of workforce to the army or the OT had resulted in a constant decrease of German workers on the motorways construction sites. But as foreign workers, as well as a growing number of forced laborers, were increasingly used to fill up these gaps, in autumn 1940, still 62,000 men propelled the construction of the motorways forward. Undoubtedly, the construction speed could not compete with the motorways heydays. But while 1939 just 250 kilometers of new roadways had been finished, the number was nearly doubled to 440 kilometers in 1940, when many Germans believed that the war was already approaching a victorious end. It is widely sunk into oblivion, for instance, that two of Paul Bonatz's most emblematic motorway bridges, the Lahn Valley Bridge at Limburg and the suspension bridge over the Rhine near Cologne, were silently inaugurated during the war, the latter as late as September 1941. Furthermore, Bonatz not only could work on projects for Berlin and Munich in those years, but also stayed engaged in the design of new bridges. And even though he sharply criticized his friend's change from, quote, Tottams into Speertams, also some of his own projects developed into oversized repetitions of 19th century models. A key example for this dissociation of architecture and engineering is Bonnard's proposal for a Rhine bridge near Koblenz from autumn 1940, where he placed two towers on either side of the main crossing steel plate girder, each of them showing three bay blind arcades like the towers in Dierschau. But Bonnard's not only designed bridges himself, he also acted as a broker for several architects who were lacking, lacking commissions due to the war. Hence, his friend Paul Schmidthenner got as well the chance to design a Rhine bridge. While his first concept for the motorway bridge near Strasbourg presented some kind of neo-Romanesque cathedral towers, Schmidthenner's final version recalled the towers by Bonatz. This similarity may not at least have owed to the fact that the Rhine was seen, like the Vistula, as a mystic border river in Germany. According to Gerdi Trost, these bridges therefore had the task to act as a gate, which articulated, quote, with symbolic power, the fortunate completion of Germany, leading its lifelines over into the repatriated land, end quote. Surprisingly, Fritz Todt did not agree at all with this development. In January 1941, he disapproved that the bridges themselves became, quote, more and more a marginal, even distracting element, end quote, and vehemently demanded a return to, quote, the previous way of designing. Despite, meanwhile, having been minister, uh, named uh, Minister for Armaments and Munitions, Todd even told his architects not to offer unsolicitedly too much to the army. But Todd's remark caused no reaction, as Hitler himself signaled sympathy for the latest bridge designs. In fact, the massive towers virtually visualized Hitler's own idea of the architectural motive of reception, which he imagined as, quote, defense, recipients, and threat at the same time, end quote. 
Furthermore, Hitler's architectural vision met with the wish of many tradition-oriented architects to draw back on architectural solutions from seemingly well-ordered times, as can be assumed, for instance, in the case of Bonnatz, for whom the early railway bridges were, quote, still infused with Schinkel's tradition. However, even the recourse on Schinkel's tradition offered more than one possibility, as can be shown with Heinrich Tessenow's proposal for a motorway bridge over the Vistula from 1941. While Tessenow's plain tower-like supplements can be even interpreted as an open rejection of Tam's ostentatious bridges, the reduced architectural expression of other designs, such as for new railway bridges over the Rhine in Breisach or Neuenburg, may have owed to the fact that railway bridges were not given the same importance as road bridges. On the other hand, first designs for a road bridge over the Rhein in Breisach by Bonatz and Schechterle initially even did not possess the seemingly obligatory fortress-like towers. But after the erection of a suspension bridge with massive pil pylons had been decided, also here an elaborated and representative, almost Roman variant was chosen. A very similar design was created by Roderich Fick in 1942 in the course of the vast rebuilding plans for Linz. Hitler himself had proposed this, uh, the idea of erecting a representative suspension bridge as he had been quite unsatisfied with the first new bridge for Linz by Schechtel and Tams, the Nibelungenbrücke, which we see here. One might think that fixed 60 meter high triumphal arches should have been perfectly met with Hitler's taste, but Fick had already lost his position as chief planner of Linz to Hermann Giesler, and Giesler commissioned Paul Bonatz and Fritz Leonhardt with the development of an alternative draft in steel. Hitler's will to accept a sober steel construction right in the heart of his most beloved urban rebuilding project was, without a doubt, caused by the suspension bridge at Cologne by Bonatz and Leonhardt as well. This edifice not only had made a lasting impression on him, but also seems to have inspired a strikingly modern sketch that we see here for the so-called Mittelbrücke in Linz, which reminds us that even in wartime, the Nazi regime's cultural policy was not generally anti-modern. An inherent uh, modernism can also be found in a study for steady connections from Germany to Scandinavia, commissioned after the successful surprise attack on Norway and Denmark in April 1940. Like in other countries, the occupation was immediately followed by plans for a new traffic infrastructure, resulting alone in the case of the Autobahn in the growth of the basic network from some 11,000 kilometers of roadways at the beginning of the war to up to nearly the double in early 1942. Even though, meanwhile, the campaign against the Soviet Union had been started, Works for connecting the future Fehmarn Belt Bridge with the German motorway system were started on 14 September 1941. On the occasion of the groundbreaking ceremony, Todd cynically recalled the idealistic tone of the European motorway utopists from the 1920s. Quote, from the beginning, the conception of the Autobahn had envisaged the expansion of the major thoroughfares into the neighboring countries. Because the Autobahn has, seen from a European perspective, no intentions of being hostile to traffic, but according to its entire character of connecting peoples and traffic. Quote, a concrete symbol for Todd's idea of connecting peoples and traffic were the detailed plans for a bridge over the Öresund, carried out in late 1941 by Bonatz and Leonhardt in cooperation with the company Krupp Stahlbau and Gottwald Schaper's son, Werner. Composed of trust girders with spans up to 300 meters, the main design welcomed the Scandinavian traveler with a well-tested gesture of intimidating bridge towers. A second version instead proposed an imposing suspension bridge with three main openings, <laughs> each of them spanning more than 750 meters. Unmistakably, the favored version the project not only tried to outrank the famous Oakland Bay Bridge as an engineering undertaking, but also to exceed it in terms of technical beauty. The design of the Arizona Bridge with it is without a doubt the climax of German bridge plans during the Second World War. With the growing problems at the Eastern Front, the planning activities were noticeably reduced in both numbers and scale. Nevertheless, 
Bonatz, for instance, still was designing bridges throughout the whole year 1942, now mainly being occupied with small-scale bridges in Alsatian villages. As Alsace, Alsace was regarded as one of the treasures of German cultural history, the usual material for these edifices was stone, like in Bonnat's designs for bridges in Villers, Surtur, or Mayenheim. Yet, also here, other proposals were possible, as can be demonstrated through a design for Grafen Staden by Werner Gabriel, a former student of Bonnat's. Even though we have no further information about this project, the slim shape of the girder indicates that the bridge was to be constructed in a brand new material, pre-stessed concrete. Actually, one of the first bridges ever built in this te new technique had been spent over the Autobahn already in 1938 um, in cooperation with the father of pre-stessed concrete, Eugène Fresinet, this one here at Ulle. At the same year, and not even 20 kilometers away, another overpass had been erected according to Ulrich Finsterwalder's idea of a self-activating pretensioning system. But while these two examples are always mentioned in the histories of precessed concrete, it is widely unknown that further bridges of this type were planned during wartime. At least one of these edifices has come to our days, a motorway bridge from the years 1941-42, which is located in nowadays Poland, some 70 kilometers southeast of Breslau or Wrocław. Furthermore, contemporary reports indicate that other buildings had been at least begun, such as a road bridge by Schechtele and Tams, in all likelihood thought to cross the Warta River in Poznan, uh, or another motorway bridge designed by Finsterwalder, which maybe even was finished. However, and besides all uncertainties on this hardly studied field, it seems to be secure to say that bridges only played a minor role on the field of priestess concrete during the war. While numbers alone for prefabricated bowstring roof girders for submarine production plants went into thousands. This transfer of a construction method from bridge building towards a war construction also mirrors the destiny of most of the bridge engineers who increasingly ended either in the army or the OT's construction squids. In 1941, only some 100 kilometers of autobahn could be completed. And on the 3rd December of that year, Todd stopped most of the roadworks. Furthermore, the influential protagonist of the motorways died some weeks later in a plane crash, and his follower, Albert Speer, immediately shut down further construction sites in early 1942. Nevertheless, construction on some sections even continued now, resulting on the completion of another 70 kilometers autobahn until all works were finally stopped as late as 1st July 1943. Meanwhile, autobahn and OT already had developed into one entity. Once more, the bridge builders of the motorway served in the army's rear area, developing due to the increasing partisan artex more and more into part-time soldiers. From around the end of 1942, also, most of the Autobahn's leading bridge designers were not involved in the planning of bridges anymore. Schaper had died, Leonhard took over different tasks in the OT, and Tams worked under spare surveillance on the design of Marshall flag towers, as well as reconstruction plans for the increasingly devastated German cities. Like some other Autobahn architects, Bonatz designed some water power plants, but at the end of 1943, he left the country for working as advisor for the Turkish government. Only Schechtel stayed involved in bridge building, now mainly concentrating on the development of makeshift constructions made of nailed wood pieces. You can see how the situation changed, meanwhile, by this. The final chapter in the history of German bridges in wartime commenced after the Allied troops had crossed the German borders. While the Autobahn had been only of minor use for the German army during the war, it now proved to be very helpful for the Allied troops, which sometimes, quote, used Hitler's innovative road network like a raceway, end quote. Exactly to prevent this case, Hitler enacted on the 19th March of 1945 uh, the so-called Nero Decree directing the destruction of any German infrastructure that could be helpful for the approaching enemy. Certainly, the bridges played a major role in this concept of scorched earth. 
thousands were blown by German combat engineers in the last weeks of the war, and Germany finally mutated from the land of bridge building into a land of bridge destruction. Thus, when the war was over, the German bridges builders one, were once more, uh, once again confronted with a provisional reconstruction of destroyed bridges. Utilizing all kinds of makeshift bridges still being usable, ranging from Sharpa's SKR bridges to large amounts of generously provided Bailey bridges, most of the German bridges were usable again before 1950. Some of these bridges, such as the Lahn Valley Bridge at Limburg, would remain in a provisional state until the 1960s. But also the construction of steady bridges came surprisingly fast in process, and most of the former protagonists of German bridge building could retain a leading position, not at least due to, due to their experiences and connections from war times. Fritz Leonhardt, for instance, realized as early as 1946 in Cologne the first large span box girder bridge of the world in cooperation with Bonnard's former employee Gerd Loma, whom he knew since the work on Cologne's Autobahn suspension bridge. Leonhardt also quickly developed into one of the world leading uh, engineers in the field of pre-stressed concrete. Ulrich Finsterwalder, already a specialist on this field before the war, now became a pioneer in the cantilever method of precess concrete bridge construction. Also, most of his record-breaking edifices were designed in cooperation with the architect Gerd Luma, the pupil of Bonnatz. Friedrich Tams, we heard about him already in the opening, uh, having been appointed head of Düsseldorf city planning office in 1948, not only made the city an assembly point of Nazi architects, but also of former motorway engineers. He initiated not only large amounts of up-to-date flyovers, but also developed in close cooperation with his Autobahn colleagues Schechterle and Leonhardt, a German post-war icon in bridge building, the Düsseldorf Bridge family, what we see down here. Only Bonnatz, meanwhile professor at Istanbul's Technical University, did not play any important role for German after-war building, uh, after-war bridge building, sorry even though he also he tried to profit from his wartime connections by proposing a spectacular bridge over the Bosporus in cooperation with his partners from the Öresund Bridge, Krupp Stahlbau. If we try to draw a conclusion on the topic, the first issue to be retained is the fact that a notable number of bridges were constructed in Germany during wartime, with more than 15% of its sections finished after the 1st September of 1939, here in green. Alone the case of the Autobahn indicates the completion of at least 750 bridges and culverts in those years, with maybe another 1,500 edifices being in diverse states of finishing on the motorway sections that were still under construction. Furthermore, the initially glittering victories on the European battlegrounds had enticed both German architects and engineers into designing increasingly monumental edifices. If built, these gigantic bridges would have become some of the most striking symbols for Hitler's enforced unification of Europe. But the dimensions of these projects stood more and more in a bizarre contradiction to the declining capacities of the German building industry. While the Vistula Bridge by Tams was finished at least without the towers, most of the projects state nothing more than hypertrophic, uh, hip hypertrophic dreams. Dreams that finally turned into the nightmare of the destruction of German bridges by their own retreating army. Unsurprisingly, neither were the projects continued, nor was the line of monumentalized expression further followed in after-war Germany. As the public also did not know very much about the war projects, it was especially for the bridge engineers fairly easy to get back to business. And for many decades, it seemed as if German bridge building had continuously produced sober and harmonious engineering structures. A picture that was also um, given by the famous book, The Architecture of Bridges by Elizabeth, Elizabeth Mock in 1949, to an exhibition in the MoMA here in New York. Um, sorry. Due to their seemingly apolitical work, many bridge engineers 
such as Fritz Leonhard, even proudly talked about their collaboration on the erection of the Autobahn in after-war times. It is my hope to have given you today a little insight into the realities they obviously tried to ignore. By building bridges, they had acted as henchmen of Hitler's politics, and for that reason, they had cooperated in burning all bridges to humanity. Thank you. Thank you.